Good morning, Walden Church. We are still going. We are still going through the Gospel of Matthew. We are on our way to Easter, on our way to the cross. Uh, last week, we were in Matthew chapter 20, and uh, I'm going to continue on in there for just a little bit. Going back to verse 17, we read this last week. It says, And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. So this event is going to be happening soon. For us, yes, but as well as Jesus. And so we're going to see this shift. And really the shift has already begun. He has started to tell his disciples more and more about the cross. He is preparing them for that day. But you know how it is when something is weighing really heavy on your mind and you have worry about it, you have stress. I mean, you knew it was coming and it was a long way off and you were okay, but as it gets closer and closer, you start to think about it more. And this big thing that's gonna to happen to you, it could be, a, could be a court date or it could be a major expense or it, or it could be surgery, right? As it draws closer to you, you begin to be aware of it more and more and your feelings about it change more and more and you start to be more internal about it. And you focus more on it and then you have less compassion for others and, and what they're going, on, going through and, and people around you. Everything else starts to feel a little small because something big is coming for you. Continuing on in Matthew, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in the kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's... It's shocking to me, <laughs> really. I mean, we've just spent two whole chapters on this very subject and we're still here, right? I mean, are you serious? Are you kidding me? Did you put your mom up to this? Of course you did. Because here's another question for Jesus. You know, Matthew spent these two chapters addressing uh, people's questions and, and he answers. But when he answers this question, even though the mom asked it, he turns and gives his answer to the disciples. He says, do you know what you are asking? And they said, yes, we do. And when the other disciples hear what's going on, they're jealous that they didn't think of it first. But I mean, come on, guys, we've just had three chapters of teaching on humility that the first are last and the last are first. I told you to be more like children. Remember all of that? And you're still squabbling over who is the greatest? I mean, it is human nature. I get it. It is. Uh, placement and medals and trophies, recognition. We want what's coming to us. We want our name on the program. We want to have everyone know that we deserved that promotion. We did most of the work on that project. We came up with the idea. Even though it was a group project, we did most of the work. But Jesus just got through saying, hey, guys, you, you know that I am struggling with something right now <laughs> and something that I'm thinking about and, and that, you know, my arrest and my execution, and you're going to follow up 
that with who among you is the greatest? Yeah, 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 Jesus, we know. But, you know, if, if you had to line us all up against a wall, and if you had to rank us, like if there was a contest for best disciple, who would you pick? And Jesus is like, you guys, you still don't get it. It's about serving. And he says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Why? Because even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Why are you guys talking to me about rank and privilege? Jesus says, as my disciple, this is your role. And it is your role because it's my role. Why did Jesus come? He says, I came to give my life, to give my life as a ransom, right? It's a gift. It's an offering. You and I, we're held hostage by sin. We are kidnapped by darkness. And Jesus comes with the bullhorn and he says, take my life instead of theirs. My life is being offered as ransom in exchange for theirs. And you know, I know we think that if we had been there, if we had been a disciple, if we had been with Jesus, then we would have, we would have got it. Said, so I would have got it. I wouldn't have made this mistake. Really, I don't think so. Because we don't prove it now with our life. Right? It, if we really are a reflection of Jesus and we are imitators of Christ, then we would also be people who serve, just like he says. We would be people who give. We would be people who pay the ransom. I mean, if you're a Christian, if you're a member of your church, your church is not a country club, right? It, there's no rank or privilege for being a member. No, you're, you are a waiter, is what you are. You're a waiter. And every visitor that comes through your church doors, it is your responsibility to serve them. Every Christian who isn't yet mature in their faith, new believers, kids, youth, it's our responsibility to serve them. I don't need anyone to meet my needs. Okay, I don't walk into church and think, People need to meet my needs. They don't, no, nobody needs to meet my needs because Jesus meets my needs. Jesus waits on me. Jesus serves me daily. Even now, Jesus serves me. He may be in heaven, but he serves me and he's never stopped blessing me. And, and, he, and the, the irony is he doesn't need my help. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need me to serve him. He, he can do it all without me. He doesn't need me. He is not waiting around. He is not halting work and waiting for me to join in. He, he is not waiting for me at all. Instead, okay, instead as a Christian, because I am grateful, because I am grateful, I should adopt an attitude of humility and then I initiate without being asked, without being asked, and I pick up a towel and I begin to wait tables. Did the disciples eventually get it? Yeah, they, they did. They did eventually get it. How do we know that? Well, because we know how they served. We know how they served, and we know how they died. Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome about uh, 66 AD under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his request since he didn't feel worthy to die in the same way as Jesus. Andrew went to the Soviet Union. Christians there claim him to be the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and in Greece, and it was said that he was crucified. Thomas was probably most active in Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far east as India, where the ancient Christians there revere him as their founder. They claim that he died there when pierced through with spears by four soldiers. Philip ministered in North Africa and then in Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul, and in retaliation, that Roman had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Bartholomew had a widespread missionary travel through India with Thomas, uh, back to Armenia and also to Ethiopia and southern Arabia. He was also martyred. James, the son of Alphaeus, ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and clubbed to death. 
Simon the Zealot ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to a local sun god. Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace Judas, tradition has him going to Syria with Andrew and uh, being burned to death. Our author, Matthew, the tax collector, ministered in Persia, Ethiopia. Some reports say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. And John, John is the only one of the apostles generally thought to have died a natural death from old age. He was a leader of the church in the uh, Ephesian area, and it was said that he took care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his own home. And during Domitian's persecution of the church in the middle 90s, uh, John was exiled to the island of Patmos. These are the lives and these are the deaths of people who serve a king, right? Disciples who risked it all because they had witnessed their king w risk it all. And it's a weird, it is a weird circle of events when you think about it, because Christ came to serve us, and then we respond by serving others. I mean, just think about the difficult lessons that we've been talking about for the past couple of days. Uh, the rich young ruler, right? He, Jesus calls him to give up everything because Jesus is everything we need, right? Jesus taught on divorce, and he calls us to love our spouse, and he promises to uphold our marriages and to love us. He, he gave us teachings on how to treat children, and he calls us to be humble like them, to help the less fortunate because he is our satisfaction. And I get it. That's not what your friends are doing, right? I know. We, we want to do what our friends are doing. We feel that peer pressure. But uh, you know what? That's okay. It's okay. You don't need to be like your friends. You need to be like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Christ must transform your Christianity. Christ must transform your Christianity. You should be, you should be a different person now. Tell me something. Has, has Jesus ever stopped serving you? Has Jesus stopped serving you? Has, has Jesus stopped blessing you? You want to know something? People were asking uh, this week about the offering plate and the offering prayer here at church, and they were wondering, you know, when we're going to bring it back. And we said, you know, we never really thought about it because the church continues to hit their budget every month. In fact, uh, we were hitting our financial goals all the way up until the war in the Ukraine. Why would a war far away and the cost of gas affect our offering plate here in Texas. Has Jesus stopped serving you? Has Jesus stopped blessing you? Of course not. But we get scared, don't we? We worry about tomorrow. We were told to put aside for a rainy day, and when it looks like rain outside, we start squirreling away our nuts. I want you to see this amazing chapter in Matthew, and I want you to closely look at Jesus. You know, he just told his disciples, I'm going to die. So admittedly, he has a lot on his mind. And to top it off, the disciples are not thinking or caring about how Jesus feels. Their only concern is themselves. And again, they go to him and say, who is the greatest? And what happens next? Verse 29 says, as they, were, as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. The Pharisees, the disciples, the rich young ruler, 
Nobody can see Jesus. See him truly, understand him, understand his purpose, his mission, why he came, and yet, there's irony, two blind men can see Jesus. Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus, in his response, he sounds, he sounds a little mean, right? Again, what do you want? What do you want? But, but you answer it for just a second. I mean, you try this experiment. Close your eyes. Close your eyes and see the living Christ standing in front of you. And he asks you the same question. What do you want? What do you want? What would you say? I mean, if you were honest, okay? If you were honest, if you were open and real and raw, what would you say? What is on your heart? What do you want from life? The answer is very revealing, isn't it? The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something and he said to her, what do you want? The answer is very revealing. Two very different requests asked of Jesus and both are asking Jesus to do something for them. So why does Jesus seem to grant the second request and not the first? What is the difference between what the disciples want and what the blind men want? Well, the blind men have just spent their entire lives at the bottom of the food chain, and they have spent their lives begging for food, begging for money, and they hear Jesus, the Messiah, coming. So they're, yes, they're going to make their best effort. They're going to make sure that they are seen, heard. They cry out. They're, They're used to getting a couple of coins every day. And maybe they'll get that. Maybe, they're, maybe the disciples of Jesus will throw them a couple of coins. Maybe even somebody will acknowledge them. That would be nice. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus would do the ultimate and he would call on God to heal them. I don't know, whatever they thought, whatever they were thinking, it was worth the risk to cry out to Jesus. They cry out in loss. They cry out in desperation. And you probably already know this, but Jesus can't ignore the cry of his children, especially when they're desperate. Psalm 143 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me in your righteousness. And to their credit, when Jesus asks, what do you want? They don't They don't say, we want coins or we want food. They they do the big ask, right? They go for the brass ring. It was their their greatest need. And notice, Jesus fulfills it, right? He heals them. But then what do they do? The Bible says, Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Jesus served them And then they became his disciples. If Jesus were to ask you today, what do you want? What would you say? So maybe another way of asking it or thinking about it is, what do you need? Right? What do you need? Or if we were going to dig a little deeper, you know, we're talking about blind men. If Jesus were to heal my blindness, what would that look like? What what is my blindness? What is the blindness that Jesus can heal in me? Last week we said we can't ignore the hard parts of the Bible, right? We can't ignore the teachings of Jesus that make us squirm. The fact that they make us squirm means that that's a growth area in our life. What, What blindness can Jesus heal from us? If Jesus were to stand in front of you and say, what do you want? What would you say? I want to offer to you uh, an answer to the question, what do you want? I'd tell you how I would answer it. Um, I would answer from Broadway. (laughs) My answer would be from Broadway. Uh, Day by Day is the opening and closing song in Godspell. And no, the song was not really written by hippies. 
Uh, the song is actually from a 13th century English bishop, St. Richard of Chichester. His poem goes, May I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly. Day by day, the song spent 14 weeks on the Billboard Top 100 in 1972. It got all the way to number 13. And that's my, that's my answer. If Jesus were to say, what do you want? Or what can I do for you? That's, that's, my, that's my only answer, to see thee more clearly. Jesus opened the eyes of the physically blind on many occasions. But I submit that the reason that he gave sight to people was a, was a deeper symbol that Jesus also restores spiritual blindness too. There's, an, there's another song that we sing in church, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, right? And the lyrics in that song suggest that you and I can look at the things of this world for so long that the things of God grow strangely dim. I don't want that. I don't want that. You know, we have, we have two chapters of people who are blind to what it means to be a disciple. Even the disciples, right? Even the disciples. The world wants me to pursue pride. The world wants me to pursue fear. The world wants me to look out for myself. That's the world's message. That's what it means to be afraid. That's what it means to be blind. People are out to get you. People are going to take from you. People aren't looking out for you, so be scared. Lock your doors. Look out for number one. Jesus didn't live that way. He's literally walking to the cross. And even with all of that on his mind, he stops his travels and he helps those who need him. Jesus never stops serving. My second prayer, to love thee more dearly. Do I love Jesus enough? The answer is probably no. Because I need to realize that the cost of being a disciple is me giving up pride and putting others first, being humble and serving. So the truth is, any love I have for myself, any area where I elevate myself, feel the need to tell others about myself or my accomplishments, or in any way put me first in the conversation, put me first in life, that is love I am taking away from others. That is love I am taking away from Jesus. If there is any area of my life where I am first and Jesus is second, if there is any area of my life where I am first and others are second, then that is an area of my life where I could learn to love Jesus more dearly. When Jesus speaks to the rich young ruler, Peter says, see, we have left everything and followed you. And we listed out the disciples and how they put it out, put it all out there, right? Everything was on the line for them, even their own lives. They gave their own life because they had witnessed their king give his own life. And the truth is, I don't love Jesus enough if I am still proud and still selfish. I do not love Jesus enough if I am still the hero of my own story. And if Jesus asked me what I wanted, my answer would be, I want to love you more. Third answer, to follow thee more nearly. This is the heart of discipleship. Jewish students had a saying they wanted to follow their rabbi so closely that their clothes would be covered in his dust, that the dust that he kicked up while he walked would cover my clothes, that that's how close I was with my, with my rabbi. And for the disciple, that was a, it was a day-by-day -day thing. Learning what it meant to let go of pride 
to let go of fear, to be humble, to serve, and to allow him to work through us. You and I, we are his disciples. We follow him so close that his dust covers us and day by day. We should put his life on display, put his teachings on display. Day by day, we put the cross on display. Why do we do this? Because even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, we do this because our King did this. Even though the world was weighing on his mind, even though he had his own troubles and he was currently walking towards arrest, walking towards persecution, walking towards crucifixion, he stops and he helps. He stops and he serves even in that. In our Matthew study, we are one step closer to the cross. Yes, Jesus is one step closer to the cross, but so are we. But you and I, we also live in this wonderful place where the cross is in the past. And the Bible also tells us that our sins are in the past. Friends, it is time to leave the nursery. It is time to leave the nest. It is time to leave safety and to go out into the streets, putting the life and death of Jesus on display, showing the world what it means not to put yourself first. The world has seen that. That message is old. That message is tired. That message is not new. We need to put humility on display, put service on display, put our King on display. The world needs to see more Jesus. Let us all dedicate ourselves to seeing him more clearly, loving him more dearly, and following him more nearly day by day. Let's pray together. Lord, what a wonderful book. What a wonderful story. Your life continues to speak to us and teach us every single day. Lord, you are our rabbi. You are our teacher and you are our king. May our lives be a reflection of you. If there's any way that we are blind, we would ask that you would open our eyes. If there is any way that we could love you more, we ask that you would remove those obstacles. If there's any way we could follow you more closely, Lord, we pray that you would guide us. Put those obvious road signs in our path that we might see them and follow them. Lord, our time here on this earth is so short. Our time is so limited. Our reach is so small. So we ask that we would make the big difference. Our lives would have impact. We would turn from our natural instinct to be selfish and self-centered egotistical, vain, that we would stop worrying about recognition, we would stop worrying about pats on the back, stop worrying about the praise from others, and we would dedicate our lives to serving. Because your son served. Even on the path to the cross, your son never wavered from his mission. And we should never waver from ours. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. 
Once again, I want to remind you, we are here. We are here every Sunday and we want you to be here. We do. And, and really, we just want you to be part of a local church, any local church, any local church where you can go and serve. And you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes to serve a church that's far away. You know, sometimes we attend a church because uh, we like the teaching or we like the music, but it's 45 minutes away. And so it's hard for us to volunteer during the week or to help. You know, we're, we're called to serve and we're called to serve our communities. And sometimes that means serving in a church that's a little closer to where we live. And true, it might not be the perfect church for us and it might not serve us. But we need to serve others. Serving your community, serving locally, might mean making a sacrifice and leaving your church where you currently are because it's just too far away. You need to plug in to the lives of the people that live in your neighborhood, the people that live around you every day, the people that you see at the grocery store, the people that you see at school, the lady that cuts your hair, your mailman. These are the people that God has placed in your life. This is your circle of influence. I know it's tough. We have friends and we have relationships at our church and they mean a lot to us and they help us grow. But the truth is, Jesus serves you and Jesus helps you grow and he is with you always. It's time to plug in to your community. That is, the, that is the growth step of a mature Christian, realizing that they no longer need to live off of baby food and mother's milk, that they feel equipped to go and to share, to, to be brave enough to leave the confines of the nest and to go out into the world. You know, we just read about all these wonderful disciples and how they left right? They left to go serve communities. And it wasn't because they couldn't serve the community where they lived. It was because there were communities who did not know Jesus. They wanted to go out into the world to spread his message. Jesus has placed missionaries exactly where he wants them. And he's put you exactly where he wants you. You live in an area that needs your ministry. You live right smack in an area where people need your talents and your gifts. I would strongly advise you to serve your church that is local. Serve your local community. Serve your neighbors. Serve where you are planted. Our church has two services. We have a traditional service at 9.30. We sing uh, all your favorite hymns and we have a church choir. And we sing the doxology, we have an offering plate, we do responsive readings, we say the Lord's Prayer. You're gonna feel very uh, at home amongst our traditional service. We also have a time of coffee and donuts in between. And so whether you come to the first service or the second, we would strongly advise you to come during that 30 minute window and meet some other people from church, shake some hands and love on one another. And then our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service. It's a more relaxed setting, come dressed casually, however you'd like. Uh, during that time, we also have our children's program. We have uh, Sunday school from kindergarten all the way through high school. And we have a middle school and high school youth group that meets every single Wednesday. So regardless of whether you attend our church or not, if you live in our community, we want your children to be a part of our youth group. Wednesday nights, six o'clock, send them over on their skateboards or their bikes. You can, they can walk over. Trust me, there will be kids there that they know because that, that group is gigantic and it's filled with kids from this community. And if they don't feel comfortable uh, coming alone, tell them to bring one of their friends. We'll, the more the merrier. We will even feed them. We will feed them dinner and we will send them home to you in about an hour and a half. Thank you. I love you guys and we'll see you soon. Bye.